to start our day's events, I'm going to welcome Paul Wiley. Paul Wiley is the ultimate comeback king. He, uh, or kid, I should say. He, um, he's fallen a lot and he's picked himself a lot, up a lot. And he's got a great story as to the cycle of what brings confidence and, and hope to somebody isn't how many times you fall, but rather how many times you pick, up, pick yourself up. There's actually a, a cool Japanese um, proverb that says, fall, fall seven, pick up eight. And Paul Wiley is literally the walking embodiment of that. So let's all welcome Paul, please. Am I on? Yeah. Wow, so great to be here. I know you're thinking, what is an Olympic figure skater doing at a user experience conference? And, uh, but at any rate, hopefully we'll, we'll know by the end of this session, <laughs> right? Is everybody feeling good? I want everybody to stand up, first of all, you know? We're gonna do a lot of sitting today, okay? And let's like get ourselves in a great frame of mind for this. Let's do our little power posing, okay? I know, you know, just don't worry about the person next to you, right? <laughs> Get that blood flowing, all right. Okay, so I'm here to talk about my story. Okay, you can sit down now, if you want. You know, stand up as much as you want. But um, I'm here to talk to you about my story and the title of my talk is Pathetic to Podium. Okay, and um, we'll get to that, <laughs> right? But how to restore a broken performer and, a, and broken performances and quickly. Uh, and, and those lessons that I learned through doing that. And you know, my name is Wiley. And so like all growing up, you know, my, everybody's like a Wiley Coyote, right? And so who's, you know, what, is, what kind of a character is Wiley Coyote, right? He's a broken performer, if you think about it. You know, lots of great abilities, right? He's very clever, right? His name is clever, right? And you know, he's got a lot of perseverance, if you think about it. But at the end of the day, you know, he is just a dreamer, like everyone, right? And so, um, so that was, you know, me growing up, right? And so I'm gonna talk about that dream that everybody has, but maybe it's in the ditch, you know? And so, you know, here I am as a little boy, right, in Dallas, Texas. I mean, probably, you know, the least likely winter Olympian, maybe. But, uh, you know, I had two older sisters and they skated, and so that's why I got involved in skating. And I always dreamed about winning an Olympic medal, right? I, I always, I, I read all sorts of books on the Olympics and things like that. And at the beginning of my career, I had a lot of success, you know? So I was, you know, in Dallas, but then we moved to Colorado and I started to, you know, win in the lower levels and get up to the junior world level. And, and I thought it was just gonna be hockey stick awesomeness for the rest of my life, you know? But then I started to get to the point where I had to do these difficult jumps in under pressure, and I started to wipe out at the World Championships a couple times, right? Maybe three times, okay? And so then I got to the Worlds the year before the Olympics, and I had a real disaster. In fact, almost like a career-ending disaster. Um, so uh, I had, I missed all three jumps in my program. I made the cut for the top 20 to skate in the free skate by one-tenth of a point. And so pretty much the rest of the world of figure skating was like, I don't get it. You know, you're 27 years old, you're a Harvard student, why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep punishing yourself? And so there was a lot of soul searching that went on that summer before the Olympics that year in 1992. And um, so I got to, you know, I sort of figured out, okay, I'm gonna get myself ready, this is my last ditch effort, I'm gonna try one more time. And I got to the US Olympic trials, right? And um, so I said, you know, I'm gonna do this once more. And the question that the New York Times reporter asked me was, what are you doing here? And he wasn't asking me an existential question. <laughs> well, you know, the purpose of my life is this. I don't think he was asking me that. He wasn't even asking me what was I looking forward to over the next 35 days. He was asking a rhetorical question, right? 
So I, I think you guys have to ask yourselves all three of those questions, right? But number one, what is your purpose? What do you want to do with your life, right? And then what are you going to do in the sprint that's coming up, like the next 35 days? And then, yeah, come on, what are you doing here, actually, right? <laughs> so um, this is me uh, in the short program at the Nationals. So you can see I'm kind of hanging on for dear life. <laughs> I 22 seconds in, right? Uh, that's my triple axle landing. So I got fourth in the short program and I managed in the free skate to earn the silver medal at the US Nationals by one-tenth of a point by one judge. And so then the international committee, you know, the people who decide who gets to go to the Olympics, they sat around for about an hour and they were debating whether they should even send me to Albertville, right? And so finally they decided to send me. And I thought, okay, well, wow, that's awesome. So I have one last chance by one-tenth of a point. And so I got to make that Olympic team. And yes, that's Tanya Harding, okay, <laughs> on this team with me, and Nancy Kerrigan. Yes, I know her. We can have a conversation at lunch. The movie is a myth, but okay, whatever. So I got to go to France. I got a plane ticket to France, and I get to go over there. And I think that what was in front of me was that fork in the road, right? And I'm going to quote Yogi Berra a couple times today. But, you know, you have to take the fork in the road, right? And so I had come to that. And it was the question that I had to myself, which is, do I just kind of hang out and, you know, get the clothes, show up at the Olympics, be a two-time Olympian Harvard graduate? It would have been OK, you know, and just kind of phone it in, be who I was always. Or do I try to do something really, really different over the next 35 days? 35 days, right? So what can you really do? And so I decided, luckily, to take my schedule out and think, OK, what can I actually do over the next 35 days? From the long program in Orlando in January 12th, and then I mapped this out on a big sheet of paper. And I was like, this is not much time, is it? Especially if you consider that you're getting on a plane, you know, February 3rd, right? But there is something there, right? And I know that you guys are up against deadlines all the time. And you guys are talking about sprints, right? So you just have to say, OK, what can I really do in this period of time before February 13th, right, before I get there? And so I went through and I said, you know, I'm, I'm taking the quote from the, the top of the UX Fest thing, which is understanding your problem well, so well that you, the solution seems obvious, right? I thought that was great, right? So, I mean, how do you understand the problem well? Okay, I knew the problem. I was, you know, facing a, a problem that Yogi Berra talks about in baseball. Figure skating is 90% mental and the other half is physical, right? So the truth is that I had to work up here first, right? And what was I missing? There were internal things and there were external things. Internally, mentally, I was facing that I can't see my triple axle, okay? A triple axle is a very hard jump. Today, it's not hard for anybody, obviously. You know, it's three and a half rotations, they do four, right? But in those days, it was hard for me, somehow. You know, that's just how the evolution of the, tech, the technique has happened and, you know, high-speed video and all that stuff. But you take off on a forward edge and you go up and you turn around three and a half times and then you land. And then I had to do a combination off of it. And I could not see it mentally. You have to be able to see that in order to then achieve it, right? So I went to my sports psychologist and I'm like, I've got to do this. I've got to work on this. The other thing that was a problem was I felt ambivalence, okay? I'd had a lot of success. I'd had a lot of failure. I'd been working at this thing for many years. And I was like, why am I even doing this? You know, that guy, Mike Janowski, was really right. What am I doing here, you know? I'm feeling really ambivalent about it. Why do I really want to do this, right? I had to resolve that ambivalence. I mean, at some level, you have to kind of fake it until you make it, and you have to decide, you know what? Today, I'm going to pretend like this is everything to me, even if I feel a little bit like, Ugh, I don't want to do this anymore, right? Then the other thing was I had a lot of doubt. Like, can I really turn this around in 35 days, or am I just kidding myself, right? Is that really possible? And if I do, will I get rewarded for 
it? Or will I waste my time and all of this has been futile effort? Because the judges, you know, the way that the politics pan out, it's not going to be anything, right? So I had to also overcome that doubt. And then the stories that you tell yourself. How many of you guys know that that's really important? The way that you talk to yourself, the self-talk. How do you see yourself? Are you the underdog or the victim? Right? And so you have to say, who am I and what do I want to do in this? Then there was external. There were a lot of distractions. I had a very talkative competitor named Kurt Browning, who's a three time world champion, amazing performer. In fact, all of the banners in the Alberville rink at the time said, Crowning Browning, right? And so you walk in, there's a story, we're going to crown him, right? And then he's just chalk at a talk, 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 talk in the locker room, you know? Distractions that are coming at you. You know, in the, in the backstage area at Alberville, it's about this big, and there's a guy standing, we talk about a user experience, right? There's a guy standing there with the camera on top of you, and all the coaches are like, and you're going, okay, I got, I got to get out there and skate now, right? What else? Relationships. I'm struggling with my relationship with my coach. My coach was like, you know, kind of on me, and he was emotional about it. It was all about him, you know, and so what were my marching orders? You know, what was the obvious solution knowing all of those things? I had to change up my psych, my psych routine, okay? I need to work on my visualization. I need to be able to see this, right? So I went to the sports psychologist and I said, you know, okay, what do I do? He said, well, when are you doing your visualizations? How are you kind of setting this up? And I said, I'm doing my visualizations at night, right before I go to bed. Isn't that when I'm supposed to do it? And he said, no. Do it when you feel the best. You know, do it at the first thing in the morning. And so I started to do those visualizations first thing in the morning, and I started to combine it with my spiritual time in the morning, and I started to kind of go with open hands and say, you know what, I don't know how to do this. And even though I'm 27 years old, I've been doing this for 24 years, it's okay, right? I'm gonna be able to learn how to do this. And so I just sort of opened my mind to it, and said, how do I do this? How do I see myself do a triple axel? And how do I see me, the perfect way for Paul to do it instead of just seeing Kurt or you know, Brian or somebody else do it? And then how do I relax in the midst of this incredible pressure? And I think you know, as an Olympian, you only experience it maybe once or twice in your life, that sort of intense focus, this outsized event, this non-human kind of you know, focus on you with the cameras and the people from all over the world in the press. And so you're preparing for this moment for literally your whole life, and then you get two shots at it, right? And you know that there's going to be a lot of adrenaline. And so how do you relax in the midst of that situation? And so I had to learn, take your, take your finger and put it on your pulse. Everyone has one, right? Okay, good. We'll talk about that. Okay, now deep breath. Now try to take your pulse down. Okay, can you? Imagine yourself in Cancun or at the top of a ski mountain, someplace that's relaxing, right? So I had to learn how to be able to do that, like how to relax myself in the midst of all of this pressure because I was continually feeling that anxiety, right? And then how to rehearse what I needed to do. So I would literally take my, I mean, so I don't know if you guys have ever been to the Neshoba Valley Olympia rink in Acton, but it's this barn in the middle of, and now it's much nicer, right? It was a barn, okay? And we had like a little boom box with, you know, I think it might have been a tape, cassette, or it was a CD player. But at any rate, we didn't even have a sound system, right? And so I would stand there in the middle of this barn and get ready for my long program run through. And I'm imagining myself with the Olympic rings, right? And the Olympic rings on the ice and the judges there and the you know, coaches there <sighs> taking my spot every single day with this real focus around, okay, this is where I'm going to be in three weeks, in two weeks, in one week. We're really facing the truth of that and then rehearsing. Guess what I did when I got to the Olympics? Switched it. Oh, I'm back in the barn, right? I'm comfortable, right? So you can do that. Your brain is a very powerful piece of equipment. <laughs> okay, and then so biofeedback and breathing, as I mentioned this, and then, and then trying to get myself <sighs> to relax. You can do it in three seconds, right? 
Um, and then getting into Olympic shape, because rap, the other half is physical, it turns out, right? So in those days, we didn't know what, what high, interval, high intensity interval training was, but I, essentially I did that. Super intense, like drenching in sweat at the end of it. I did back-to-back run-throughs of my free skate program, which is four and a half minutes each time, twice in a row. Everyone in the rink is like, you are crazy. Uh, and then I was able to do it clean. And then multiple repetitions of my jumps so that I could do 10 triple axles in a row, right? So I really felt ready to do this. I also focused on my meals, you know, sort of eating well. <laughs> and it seems obvious, right? You know, your physical body really plays a part. And so, but I really trimmed down and I was getting good sleep and I was getting to the point where I felt prepared. Now, let's talk a little bit about the importance of those stories in my life, though. And the way that you take, you know, you get stories from outside, right? I mean, there are, there are stories that you've had since you were a little child. You know, in my family, one of the stories that we had was that our family has a weight problem, right? And so I just grew up thinking, well, you know, I'm ectomorphic and, you know, I can't, get myself, you know, I have to put myself on a diet. And it was like all of that stuff. You know, you have a story out there. And then there's the stories that you create for yourself. And they might be really positive, you know, like I can fight through anything. Or it might be I'm a choker. I choke at the world championships, right? So here are some of the stories that people were saying about me after nationals, right? The biggest disappointment of the round was the 27-year-old Wiley who has become almost a pathetic figure at the national level, right? So pathetic was a quote, right? That's from the New York Times, right? The, the paper of record, right? My coach, you could win, right? He literally, during one of our practices, you know, I, he says, so how do you think you're going to do at the Olympics? And I said, oh, you know, I'm hoping that I get top five. He said, top five, you could win. And I was like, what? So do you hear the dissonance in these stories? So you might have to resolve that dissonance, right? And then send Mark Mitchell, he's our future. Paul had his chance. You'll see, you'll hear Scott say that, right, in the video. And then at the Olympics, the Alexei Mission, the coach of uh, Plushenko and Yagud and this like phenomenal Olympic coach from Russia comes up to me and says, you are a dangerous man. <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> awesome, that's good, right? And then Evie, my coach, I don't owe you, you owe me, right? You hear it? That kind of like, it's all about me, right? So there's stories that are kind of like swimming around and you have to kind of aim for your true north somehow. What other voices were there? He's been brilliant all week in practices. This is at the Olympics, right? The most consistent of the American skaters. And then Mike Janowski again. Paul Wiley is highly susceptible to the pressure of major events. What's true? For me, I'm skating best of the Americans. An American is usually on the podium. I could be on the podium. That was a really important story for me to say. So I'm walking in the opening ceremonies, and aren't these some smart looking outfits? <laughs> right? I could tell you that I've worn that scarf many times, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, but very proud to be representing the United States there. And it, it comes down to those moments, right? And so, I don't know, do you guys, has, did you guys watch the Olympics this year, right? And it's just phenomenal to me. Like, you go in and you make all these assumptions about what's going to happen. I mean, I worked the Olympics in Pyeongchang for Westwood One Radio, and so I'm there the whole time watching all of the practices. And everybody comes in and they're the, the pundits, you know, and they're saying, well, Nathan Chen is going to win. And you're like, OK, well, that, we'll see, you know, what's going to happen, right? And, and they're like, this one's going to win and that one's going to win. They're trying to declare the winner. I'm sure it's the same way in product development, right? Everyone's trying to declare the winner, right? But it's you that have to figure out, like, what you're going to do, right, in the moment. And so Nathan did not you know, have the Olympics of his life. He won the world, right? So you get, so anyway, I got to the Olympics and I'm, I feel like I'm skating the best of the Americans. And the day of the short program, you know, you take a nap because that's what you do before you get ready. And then my girlfriend came over to the Olympic Village and we kind of hung out and we, you know, talked and then she left and I started to feel this cloud over me, right? I don't know if you've ever had that, but a sense, it's not depression, right? But it's a sense of importance and gravitas, right? 
it's actually a respect, and it's good. But you can misinterpret it and think that it is going to derail you. But you have to understand where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that in figure skating, it's 24 years of work that translates into 0.8 seconds that could spell disaster for you, right? There's a triple axle at the beginning of the short program, and it's go or no go if you land it, period. And I know that. I've known that for four years, right? And so there's a gravitas to that moment. And this is what the, the Sports Illustrated reporter said as he was writing his thing afterwards. Wiley seemed headed for disaster as usual, right? So in this short program warm-up, you get six minutes to like scramble around. And you know, there's a, incredible adrenaline. Everyone's on the ice at the same time. There's six guys warming up. And you know, you come around and you're setting up, and I'm doing, you know, all of my jumps and getting the triple axle ready. And I set up the triple axle the first time, and here's what he said. While attempting a triple axle in warm-up, he hurled off his axis. He looked like a man leaping into a bed and took the hardest fall he'd taken all week. And it's true. And then I did it again. So the second attempt in that uh, warm up was a complete disaster. So I get off the ice having fallen on both attempts of this jump that is going to be the jump that is going to determine my future and the way that I've thought about the whole career, right? The way that anybody thinks about my career. And the only word that I could think of that would make any sense was the word trust. I had finally to trust in my training because I couldn't read. I, on that feeling of doing it in the warm-up, I had to know going into that jump that it was going to be okay. And I don't know, you know how you get to that point, but um, this is what happened, okay? If you guys want to switch over and show that video. Now on the ice, the stylish young man from the United States. Stylish, right? 27-year-old Harvard graduate. Paul Wiley. I know, my hair. It's blow dried right there. Paul is a very complete skater. He does so many things so well. Choreography, artistry. Here it Opening is, guys. combination, a triple axle and a double toe loop. Triple axle, double toe. The one thing that has held him back is his nerves. He tends to be inconsistent in competitions. He struggled with that triple axle in the warm-up, but he delivered it in the competition. Well, he's been uh, brilliant all week in practice. The most consistent American skater. Spiral into triple flip here. And over the past few years, he has had problems with the original program. Seems that once the pressure is off, he just skates with great verve and flair in the free program. Rating spins. Great position on this camel spin. In this change of foot spin, they have to have 15 total rotations. Anything less is a deduction. Mitchell, I think, who was the third place finisher, is sitting home 
wishing Paul Wiley well. That's not just well done, that is terrific for Paul Wiley. And everyone in the skating world in the United States cares for this young man. They have got to be thrilled for him. When he is on, he so, is one of the finest That moment changed my life, literally, okay? Because it literally had been four years in the making and I knew how important it was. And it didn't matter what the result was. But it turned out that there were a lot of guys who messed up that night, right? And so I was in third place after the short program. And so all of a sudden, the pathetic figure, it was like, pan to the pathetic figure. <laughs> huh. You know, and so they're like, can you be on the CBS This Morning Show with Paula Zahn tomorrow and Harry Smith? Okay, yeah, I can. And then I'm like, this is a really different way of approaching this, you know? And so I go to the team sports psychologist and I'm like, Shane, I need some help because my, my, my mind is blown. I want to get a plane ticket home at this point because like my career is made. You know, I just want to be done, right? I did it. But there's a long program, the free skate, and I can finally maybe get what I want from the sport, right? I can maybe actually reach that moment when there's an exclamation point at the end of it. And so, you know, the, so Shane says to me, listen, this is my advice to you. Go to the Olympic Village and get in your room. And for half an hour, I want you to just blue skies. You know, just think about what happens if you get what you want, right? We spend so much time trafficking and all of the little problems and the, the ways that we're going to deal with the issues that we have instead of like thinking about, you know, what happens if this really works out? Right? And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'll probably get into whatever grad school I want to go to, right? And then um, I'll probably be able to pay for it because I'll be a professional skater making some money. And, and oh, by the way, I might even have an exclamation point at the end of this career, right? So I had to push through that imperfect in the free skate and finish well. And so that's what, and then that's what he told me to do. So here is the free skate. Um, let's see. So Paul Wiley has competed in 11 U.S. National Championships and never won. He's been to four worlds with ninth his best finish. He made this year's Olympic team by one-tenth of one point. And tonight, he can take home an Olympic medal. And to think that Paul Wiley was a controversial selection to the Olympic team. A lot of people felt, send Mark Mitchell, he's our future. Paul Wiley had his chance. Now Paul Wiley has a chance to win an Olympic gold medal. The triple axel. Triples out, a little slip on the landing there. That's not one of his strongest jumps. Every Olympic performance impacts the rest of your life. And this Olympic performance will definitely impact Paul Wiley's in the most positive way. Thirty-five days after the fact, I come and I sit in the kiss and cry area, which is what they call it, <laughs> and my name comes up right underneath Victor Petrenko in second place. And then I'm waiting for four other people in that green room and hoping that they just skate their best, right? And <laughs> I got to take home the silver medal for the United States. And it was one of those moments that just absolutely, um, you know, changes your life, right? And then I went to Stars on Ice, and I went back to school. Um, and I went to the real world, <laughs> Disney, right? Um, and, he, and then I did some commentary, and, and now I work a little bit for j and
Bay and Westwood One, and I had a family. And so life changes, right? As you move forward, the North Star really changes, right? And um, so as I'm moving into my 50, I'm in my 50s now, um, you know, there becomes a focus on wellness, right? And so I start to do some running and get ready for this stage race that's called the Blue Ridge Relay. And I'm going out and I decide that I'm going to, you know, work, work out with this group in the morning, an early morning workout. We, you know, are doing sprints. They say, you know, there's going to be 200s and 400s and 600s. And, you know, someone is probably going to puke this morning. <laughs> Okay, great. You know, I'm in for it. You know, I go to this really high level um, workout with this guy, so I better be ready. So, and sort of halfway through one of the 600 sprints, I lean forward and fall on my face, you know? And the guy behind me notices that I'm down, comes over, turns my head sideways. I'm still breathing. And then he notices that I'm not breathing anymore, and there's no pulse. So he flips me over, having just learned CPR. He does CPR on me, and then the guy behind him takes over from him, who is, and the guy behind him is a stonemason by trade, and so he's giant and breaking my ribs, right? And after six minutes, there's still no pulse. And so they're calling 911, 911, the, the, the medics come in, they, they try to get me with the defibrillator, it doesn't work. Well, it maybe works, but it doesn't bring my heart rate back, right? And then they give me a, a shot of adrenaline into my shin. And then finally, I come back. I'm jolted back to life. And so they put me into the ambulance, and they cool my body down, because that's what they do if you've been out for that long. Because otherwise, you start to really churn into all sorts of difficult medical situations. And then they took me to the hospital. And my wife sat there in the intensive care unit with my sneakers on her lap for two days while I was in a coma waiting for me to come out. And the doctors had told her how he comes out of this coma is going to really tell you who he's going to be. And be ready because sometimes people do not have the mental wherewithal after they've gone through something like this. And you can argue, uh, you know, that I don't, but uh, whatever. <laughs> Um, as I came to, my first words were, health insurance! Because <laughs> I was really worried that we hadn't been paying the premiums. <laughs> I'm watching all these people walk around and I'm thinking to myself. And then it took me the longest time to figure out, like, why did they bring me over in an ambulance? Right? Why didn't they just put me in the car? I mean, obviously, I just passed out. So I'm not thinking straight at that point. But what a miracle. Right, what a miracle that, you know, I had this guy here, here's the stonemason, and that, you know, see, you can see I had that little thing over my eyebrow. I mean, it's not as impressive as yours, actually, sorry. But at any rate, um, and these are the people that were in my story. They, we were, had, a, had a celebration, my kids as well. Um, you know, Eric was the first guy and Billy the other. And, um, and I just say, you know what, you have to learn to bounce, like Tigger, right? And, um, and to bounce back. Because life, you know, you might not get sudden cardiac arrest in a workout. OK, I hope you don't. But you're going to face other setbacks. And your people are going to face other setbacks. And the people that you report to, they're, you're in the midst of a human drama, OK? And OK, you might have laughed at every Olympic performance affects the rest of your life. But there are things in your life that will affect the rest of your life. And so when you get there, make sure that you, you know, take the tack of bouncing back and getting back to it. I was able to run with those guys in the 10, um, in the 10 miler in the Twin Cities for Medtronic, because I have, I have several Medtronic devices, it turns out. And um, yeah, because I had to get open heart surgery as well last year, and so because I had aortic stenosis. But I'm good now, right? And I'm, because I really think I learned something before Alberville, which is you take that time that you have, and then you see what you can do. And then you ask yourself the big question, where do I want to go, right? What do I want to be? And what am I doing here, right? So ask yourself that big question, and then go for it, OK? Thanks.